Nick Ronson um, is one of those unsung heroes. He's something special. When we'd be on the stage with Bowie, he'd be singing along with him, and the way the voices matched was uncanny. And uh, his sense of production value. He gave me some very interesting advice in 1973. He said to me, I really like your piano playing, and uh, I don't think you should do too much studio work in Los Angeles or New York. He said you should pick and choose the ones you want. He said, but I don't want to see your music become white toast and people use you and all of a sudden you're a caricature yourself, a caricature of yourself and you're, and you're, you know, you're just repeating all the same things. And he says, do your own music, do your own concerts, play with some of the big stars that you like and pick and choose if you do them. And I said, okay, I'll listen to you. And I have. And uh, it was very, very interesting advice. Mick Ronson was the guy who auditioned me for David Bowie. Oh, really? I was in Brooklyn giving a piano lesson. I was also babysitting my two-year-old daughter. My wife was working. The phone call comes in from David Bowie. I said, I don't know who David Bowie is because I was a jazz musician. They got a kick out of that. And they said, can you be in Manhattan in 20 minutes for an audition for David Bowie and the Spiders from Mars? So I let, let my piano student babysit my daughter. I got in the car, went from Brooklyn to Manhattan. I was there in 20 minutes, walked into RCA Studios, and each of these guys in the Spiders from Mars and Bowie had a different color hair but, I mean, really wild looking with all kinds of stockings and boots and one guy had stuff that came down like this, looked like payas or something from the Hasidic uh, tribe, you know, and, and very red hair from one guy and silver from the other one and stark black. And I come in dressed in dungarees, you know, and black t-shirt. And there's three of them behind the glass in the studio and Mick is at the piano. And he says, come over to the piano. And he shows me the chord changes to a Bowie song called Changes. Yeah, cha-cha-cha changes. That's the one. So he puts the uh, music on the, uh, on the piano and he says, play. So I read, it, read down the intro and I played a few runs. And uh, I remember the chords uh, as I was looking at them saying, oh, I know what to do with this to make it sound nice. I played for eight, seven, eight or nine seconds. I don't remember exactly. And he said, you got the gig. I said, wow. I didn't play yet. He said, no, I could tell. Yeah. So he had that perception. He could tell. And we had, we had a great time from then on, you know. So I do that for, for two years, hired only for eight weeks. Then I go off and I play jazz again. So it's nice that you mention him and it's nice that you work him because he's obviously uh, starting to get his due now, unfortunately, after his death, you know, but he was a marvelous uh, guitar player. He knew how to work a big room, too. I mean, like, oh you know, 100,000, oh 90,000 people at LA, uh, yeah. Yeah. LA uh, Coliseum. And he had this thing, he had um, been given or he came to the to this band with a um, a MIDI controller guitar and a um, a sound source of some kind and he and a foot pedal and he didn't understand what the sound source was but he didn't care it wasn't important and he would you know he'd take a stance like this and he'd hit a chord and hold his arm up like he would and shake it and then step on the pedal and out rhinos, you know, rhinoceros sounds would come. Or else it'd be bees or just weird. But it was, and he, and he acted not surprised by it, like I meant that sound to come. And it was perfect for the band that we had and T-Bone was avant-garde in his way. That's but wild. it was, for opening for The Who, it was us and The Clash. That's wild. So we were, yeah. That's wild. Yeah, he was, I, I miss him. Oh, yeah.